Ryzen 9000 is coming, Google kills off another product, and NVIDIA, they're blaming Intel. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Monday, April 15th, 2024. We're gonna start off today with a slew of news that's coming out about the next-gen CPUs from both Team Red and Team Blue because more BIOS updates are dropping, this time for MSI. The new Ajisa updates are showing that Ryzen 9000 is popping up in case you wanna update your motherboards, the B650s. They can now be ready for whenever AMD decides to launch the Ryzen 9000 series CPU. CPUs. We're expecting these to launch in the second half of this year, hopefully July, based on the frequency of updates that we're getting to both drivers and BIOSes for these CPUs. It could be a good time to wait for that. But in case you're waiting for Intel's next gen, well, we got some new details popping up about Arrow Lake. These are now appearing across the internet, showing what we could potentially expect. Now, these do look like engineering samples with low clock speed. So between 2.3 and 3 gigahertz, not likely to be the end result. But what we do see is that they are 20 and 24 cores respectively, and that there is no hyper threading amongst these cores. So you're looking at purely just having the P cores and E cores with no extra threading, whether or not that makes it to launch, or if this is just, again, in engineering samples where they have the hyper threading turned off for whatever reason, we'll have to wait and see. But in addition to those cores, while the highest end Arrow Lake chip is expected to have 24 total cores that you use, they are also supposed to have two extra ultra low power cores that are gonna be on their own SOC island that's gonna make it so that they have more efficiency to them and those aren't gonna be included in the total core count. But one of the big updates we are expecting for Arrow Lake and whatever, I guess they're calling it Core Ultra 200 instead of 15th gen or whatnot, is that these are supposed to have faster Intel graphics baked into them, XELPG, which is currently on Meteor Lake, instead of just the XELP that's on what's currently out in Raptor Lake. So good updates potentially coming on the GPU side. I don't know how many people are necessarily excited for Arrow Lake to come out, especially after we're expecting AMD to drop Zen 5 well before Intel even has this ready. So we'll just have to see how that goes. But I know a lot of people are excited about Battle Mage. So let's talk about a little hope that we have there. And that is Intel's adding another partner, Biostar, coming on board as an Intel GPU company. They release an Arc A750. Now, this is not Battle Mage, but it does show that if companies are continually signing up with Intel to sell their graphics cards, number one, they probably see that there's at least a market for them to make some sort of money, which bodes well. Additionally, this could carry over to Battle Mage, having more options and more companies that are selling these cards when the B770 drops could be could 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 bode well for Battle Mage. And what's boding well in the EV sector is Aptera. This is a company that I follow closely simply because I absolutely love the idea of a solar powered vehicle. I have my $100 pre-order with them, but they did just receive their first production body to their San Diego headquarters. It's going to be the shape of the cabin that's going to be released in the official version of the Aptera car that's going to be coming out. Hopefully, allegedly, Later this year, that's what they said when we actually took a test drive with them on the Cannonball last year when we visited them in San Diego. Maybe sometime this year they might do deliveries. I'm not quite sure they're gonna be able to keep up on that timeline. I'm also not sure that they're gonna be able to keep up on the price because these things are reasonably affordable for what they're promising in terms of spec and capacity. Honestly, I love my time with the Aptera vehicle that I got to spend driving it. I do absolutely want one. I think it could be a great daily commuter for me, especially since my commute's just a few steps down the, the stairs. <laughs> Just in case you've never seen or heard of their pricing before, they are promising up to 400 miles battery with a zero to 60 of 4.2 seconds with up to 40 miles of daily charging on their launch edition version of the Aptera. And that's only gonna cost $33,000, which for 400 miles of range is not terrible at all. Currently, I have pre-ordered their 1000 mile range version, which has all of the solar panels, which are included everywhere on the car on the top, making it so that you can charge effectively all wheel drive. That's the one that I'm I'm waiting out for, and I'm probably going to be waiting a long time because they're only promising on launching that 400 mile one this when they do start coming out in their launch edition. But that's enough about my love for Aptera. Let's see how Reese loves you with the deals he's bringing you today. Yo, welcome back to Yifty Deals, bringing the hottest take deals out on the internet. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Mine was super eventful because I went down to see my little brother get married. So. 
Round of applause for them before we get on into the deals. But speaking of deals, we're starting off today with the summer 3-in-1 120mm case fan kit with this 3-pack featuring daisy chain ability for only $21.99 making it $40 off. And while the connectors are simple and not as fancy as something from Lian Lee's offering, it's still $22. But then next up we have my favorites, the Sony WH-1000XM4 wireless noise cancelling headphones. Specifically this refurbished kit's going for only $179.99 and I will never not recommend these because these are my daily drivers and more pocketable than the new generation which is a big deal and then lastly continuing our string of monitor deals we have something more on the professional side this time with the asus pro art pa27 8qv this 27 inch 1440p monitor has a hundred percent srgb color coverage and a delta e reading of less than two making it great for color accuracy and all your professional needs for only 239 dollars making it 80 dollars off and with that the deals are done you can find these and more linked in the video description down below but until next time i'm gonna hand you back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, here's the deal. Google give, Google kill. That's just how it works. Google Graveyard's getting another one, which is the Google One VPN. Google coming out and saying that nobody's using it. This VPN that's included with Google One subscriptions, just not enough people using it to maintain this service that they're bringing out. However, one of the things that's really interesting that I'm just kind of thinking is that this is included in a subscription that they already give, which gives you cloud storage. It also gives you like photo storage and a few other accessories. The VPN was included as part of the reason why people would sign up to Google One. But if they're removing features like that, is this technically shrinkflation? You're paying the same amount, they're removing features I mean, were you using it in the first place? It's it's a it's a curious little environment that we're running into. However, I will remind you that Google has two other VPN services that they are not getting rid of. So they have the Pixel VPN service, which is for Pixel phones through Google One. So there's like a Google One Pixel VPN and a regular Google One VPN. They are not killing the Pixel one. They are keeping that one. They are killing off the regular one that normal people get. And then they're also keeping their Google Fi VPN, which is through their wireless carrier. So there's gonna still be Google VPNs, but it's not, it's the, one of them dies. That's how it works. Speaking of die, let's talk about direct die CPU cooling. EK announcing that they have a few more solutions for direct die CPU cooling. In case you're not familiar with that, that's when you take a chip, you peel off the IHS, and then you cool the remaining part. You get rid of the part that you normally are associating with cooling. And the reason people do this is that you get better temperatures. The IHS actually can prevent you getting the best cooling performance. However, it does protect the dye that's underneath. That's kind of why it's there, is to make sure that you don't screw up. They are releasing custom liquid blocks in case you want to add this to your loop for both Intel and AMD, but they're also announcing that they're going to be releasing an AIO that's meant to be direct dye. This is part of their Nucleus AIO lineup, and the reason they're doing this for LGA 1700 specifically is because so many people are delitting the Raptor Lake and Raptor Lake refresh chips. 13th and 14th gen get so hot and people want to cool them down so badly that the delitting community for this has gone through the roof. And so EK saw that and said, hey, we should probably get in on this, which is why they're doing the direct die cooling, which, oh boy, this could potentially lower the temps on these super beefy CPUs, making it so that they run within more reasonable temperatures. However, we did talk about how Intel's high-end 13th and 14th gen chips are experiencing some extreme instability that's getting awareness in the community. Intel says that they're looking into it, but Nvidia wants you to know that if this is happening, with an NVIDIA GPU, don't talk to them about it, okay? They released a new driver update and they made sure to note that if you are experiencing problems with your VRAM or your GPU bugging out or anything and you're running these chips, talk to Intel, not them, because it is not their fault. Specifically citing a community post by an Intel employee saying that Intel is looking into this and if you have any issues with this, please contact Intel's customer support. There's been a lot of I guess community discussion surrounding this part and there's kind of been um, hints from certain members of Intel who haven't said anything officially, but the general gist is this is because of motherboards. This is because motherboards are actually running these CPUs higher than they're supposed to be straight out of the box. The settings that are in a Z790 motherboard from any of the major companies is too much for what Intel rates the CPU for and that's causing the degradation. The voltage 
too high, the power too much. It's actually pushing the CPU too far, which makes it perform better for you when you first get it. But as the instability creeps in, that's not what Intel's actually rating these CPUs for. So you might wanna bring things down in your BIOS that should help bring stability. One of the most common solutions that I've seen touted around is the fact that people are setting their multiplier to 52 times. So you get 5.2 gigahertz on these CPUs, which is significantly slower, especially if you got a 14900KS, that's a full gigahertz slower than the max rated boost clock on those chips. Now, also just a, a reminder for you, a boost clock that a CPU says that it's capable of hitting, it doesn't hit that on all cores. That's not the all core boost. That's something completely different. So you're not, you are cutting it down by one gigahertz, but that 6.2, I think you're hitting on one or two cores at most. And then the rest of them are running at a significantly lower clock speed. So just lowering the clock speed, lowering the voltage, lowering the wattage should bring back the stability. Should this have happened in the first place? Probably not, but again, motherboard BIOS settings is likely the reason for it. However, that doesn't mean Intel gets out of blame for this because they probably encourage motherboard manufacturers to do this, or at least, you know, turned a blind eye to the default overclocking because it makes them perform better and it makes it look like they get better benchmarks than they actually are supposed to, or at least what they're warrantying their CPU used for. So we'll wait for Intel's official response, but if you're suffering through this, swap out the motherboard settings and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be upset. And you guys seemed a little upset in Friday's episode of Hot News. So let's get into the comment response. We got SEC Central saying Apple released a statement on they will allow you to change slash repair your devices. Tells you everything you need to know. And then Lost Soul said, yeah, don't try to defend Apple there. They're trying to make it so expensive people still can't or won't want to repair. Apple is rotting from the inside out ever since the only person to actually care about the company has long since been gone. I don't think that's true as far as like the only person who cares about the company. Additionally, like this is one of the, I think, most difficult tensions to walk when it comes to uh, almost anything in life is like the desire for things to get better. Everybody wants Apple to be better about their repair process. Their parts pairing situation is nonsense. All like we want that fixed. However, they're not doing that completely. However, like they are making steps and regardless of the reason that they're happening, like there's this tension of like, can we regard this as a good thing while also demanding more and not like crapping on the efforts of probably people within Apple who have been fighting to get them to fix things because Apple is a large company. I guarantee you that there are people who work in that company who care about the things that you do. It's just the odds and probabilities of that happening are very high and they are probably working within a very difficult system and infrastructure to push through changes that are good for the community but are potentially less than ideal for Apple shareholders. And so when these things happen and you don't recognize that there is value and that this is a good thing, even if it's not the best thing that could happen, like it could potentially just make it more difficult for the systems and infrastructures that are in place within Apple to like have those voices heard. Because if the community response every time Apple does something positive is, you suck, you should have done more. It creates a poor feedback loop between the company and its customers. And it's one of those things that happens in relationships. You want people to be better. You want them to be the best versions of themselves. And if you don't celebrate the minor wins that you get along the way, it creates tension and hostility where it could potentially be more. Should Apple be doing more in the right to repair scene? Absolutely. Should parts parry exist? I understand their arguments for why it shouldn't, but I think that there should be more freedom and flexibility for third-party repair services to be able to do what they want with those devices. There are complicated machinations at place and all I have to say is I'm an Apple shill, so you know, what does it matter? Anyways, my, my points are irrelevant. And then on Flow Plan on Friday's episode, we got NRP saying teraflops. Learn that from level one tech, shout out to Wendell. And then Dappin Age saying, didn't know y'all had a Flow Plan till today's episode. Happy to support y'all on a platform that sounds and looks better. I appreciate you, thank you. And then I pissed a lot of people off by saying that Linux is not ready for the vast majority of people to switch over to. I said Mac OS is, and the just comment after comment of people saying, no, you're wrong, Brett. No, I did it. Oh no, I had my friend do it. No, my friend who's not even as tech savvy as I am did it. And I think like, I know my audience, you guys, 
are ready for Linux. I understand that Linux for the people who are actually into PC building in the tech community is accessible to the point where it is usable. But if you just look at statistics, Mac OS is going up in usage while Windows is going down and Linux is like mildly gaining, like very, very minimal. And so just looking at the data, that's all I was saying. Mac OS is the one that people are switching to when it comes to the general consumer. Windows is getting frustrating to use they are making things difficult, so people are switching to Mac, not Linux, or they're switching to Chromebooks. Companies and schools and everybody are not handing out iPads anymore. They're not handing out Linux devices. They're handing out Chrome OS, which you could argue is Linux, but it's segmented differently anyways. I'm not saying that Linux can't be right for a lot of people or that you haven't found that it's ready for you. I'm saying for regular people, they're not switching to Linux. And if you think they are, I would argue that you probably need to open up your circle of who you're interacting with because they are not. But we are d are doing are doing videos on things that uh, aren't Apple things, which is a knockoff Vision Pro headset. Kyler did that video it released over the weekend. We got a couple comments there. Sid lives saying, "Gotta love knockoffs that give you 50% of the original functionality." I responded to that saying, "50% is generous." The Amdor VR headset is just absolute dog water. It is trash. It is garbage. And then Soil Tech saying, "Great video, Kyler. You're doing way better at making these." I agree. He's uh, come a long way in his video production skills, and, and I'm happy that we have somebody that I can uh, refer to in the office and just say. Hey, create a video, we'll get it out. And I don't necessarily have to be the one driving all of that. It's been great to have Kyler around making all of those videos happen. Which he actually had a second one come out this weekend, a sponsored video by G Skill on their Widgie Dash PC accessory. And over on Flowplane, we got Scarfo saying, Great job, Kyler. The auto key is a neat challenge. I'd like to see you create a custom Ida 64 layout with your personal touch. I'm interested to see if there's dragging volume bars that can take on a Stream Deck wave dials. Um, I don't know if that there is that, but uh, the, the thing about the Widgie Dash is that you could create your own version of that in case you wanted to i can tell you right here speaking for kyler personally um we don't really use ida 64 in the office i don't think kyler uh wants to pay for the licensing for that um he would just rather have his computer run hot and explode than know anything about what's going on that man that man broke his computer in six ways to sunday and it Listen, I to 64 in his bag of chips and my bag of chips are calling for me. So I'm going to end this episode of hot news. We'll be back with more of the hottest tech news for you tomorrow, my friends. Goodbye.